everyone how are you well, i'm doing great welcome to deaf woke i am antoine hunter also known as purple fire crow today december 2nd 2021 whoo whoo Whew. I don't know how many times I can say, Woo, we're almost to the end of the year. I mean, a lot has happened in 2021, right? A lot of ups and downs. But you know what? We're all still winning, right? But what does it mean by winning? You know, winning is doing the best that we can do as human beings. Every day, we keep on keeping on. You know, we're being the best human we can be, the best person you can be. So I'm thoroughly excited for today. You know, we've learned about so many people uh, in this world. And so before, uh, before we start, I'm going to go ahead and have my interpreters come on in so you can see what they look like. Hello. Hello, interpreters. This is Rodney. This is his name sign. And this is interpreter Jay. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today, uh, supporting Deaf Woke and the Deaf community. Uh, and offering your beautiful service. And, uh, so you can see all that energy. So that's one reason why I'm excited. Um, now let's go ahead and move on to our beautiful guest we have today, uh, Mr. Jermaine Williams. This is his name sign. Jermaine is, is, comes from Dallas, Texas, uh, with some Arkansas spice. Jermaine comes from six generations of black deaf. Uh, and, and that's something we'll touch on a little later. Uh, that's black deaf family members. Jermaine is a proud deaf leopard uh, alumni of Arkansas School for the Deaf. He's a full-time employee of a social impact business that serves the deaf and hard of hearing community of North Texas. Jermaine, when you see, you'll know why he loves working out. He's swole, but he loves running, eating, and traveling as much as he can. So let's let's go ahead. I don't want to continue. I just, I want to go ahead and bring on uh, Jermaine. Come on, Jermaine, come on in. Hi, hello, hello, hello. Uh, woo, 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 woo. Man, welcome, man. Welcome to Deaf Woke. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, how are you? I'm doing good. You know, with everything considering what's going on in the world right now. Um, and like you just mentioned, you know, the fact that we're still here, that we're alive, that's really something that we have to you know just take one day at a time now where are you where are you residing now i'm in my kitchen <laughs> slash bedroom um but no no um, i'm sorry i meant what state uh, or city yeah dallas okay yeah. dallas texas now we got people going from all over 
Uh, but yes, yeah, so you're over in Dallas. So, okay. You know, like I'd mentioned in your uh, bio, you come from a strong, deaf, black gen uh, family generation, right? Yep, six generations. Thank you for that comment. But um, yeah, six generations right now. Uh, we're doing some research still, and we're still counting uh, all of our, our black, deaf family members. Um, but we oftentimes don't spotlight black, deaf families. And so typically the spotlight goes to white, deaf families. and so trying to like get away from that right now but you know right now it's our time you know the BIPOC community Hispanic to black communities we need to be highlighted as well I agree yes it's time for us to wake up right you know talking about our family and that's why we offer deaf woke you know trying to get the people woke so I noticed that your name sign so what's the story behind that? So uh, my name is Lana actually comes from, uh, so again, having deaf parents. Um, so my first sign name was JP. My name, Jermaine, and my middle name, Brady. You know, like uh, the Brady Bunch family, not like that person <laughs> specifically, but my middle name is Brady. Um, but I was known as JB my whole whole life. That's my nickname. Until I went to the school for deaf, Arkansas School for Deaf. And there was so many students whose name sign was JB in some sort of some fashion. And so they then gave me JB, but position on the chest because of my kind heart. And so of course I was grateful for that. So for a while I used that name sign JB on my chest. But then my family signed something different, right? So I was used to my family sign, then I had this, this cool name sign that I had. But then a few years ago, I decided to change my name sign and give myself one, more of something that was empowering for me, um, like a new badge or medal of honor, uh, a way to just identify myself. And so for a while, I was thinking about what really fits my personality, what fits my, my mind and spirit, what really identifies who, me. And for a while, um, you know, my name is pretty long, uh, but my first name, Jermaine, has eight letters in it. Brady has five letters. Williams also has eight letters. I was born in August. August is the eighth month of the year. And yeah, of course. <laughs> I was born in the year 85. My birth date has number eight in it. And so I was just like, well, wow, well, that just fits in the ASL, right? 8-5, right? That means you know, something exciting. And so that just became the name sign that I chose for myself. And so I'll, oftentimes with my friends, you know, whenever we're talking or whatever, spilling tea, uh, in general, deaf community, you know, that's the thing that we do. But <laughs> the point is, is that when we're spilling tea with each other, right? You know, people are like, oh my gosh, really? Don't oh, stop. And like, ooh. So we'll, we'll do things like that. And so it just fit. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. You, I love that name, son. I love the story behind how you empowered yourself. Uh, it, oh. You know, growing up myself, I'm recognizing more of who I am. And so we need to give ourselves permission. So like, this is who I have become. Who I was then is much different who, than who I am now. You know, I, uh, Black deaf often, you know, don't give ourselves permission to grow. You know, it's the, you know, the, you know, kind of, it's, uh, it's the evolution, you know, that especially the generation of having a black deaf, uh, you know, really that generation. I grew up with predominantly hearing parents or predominantly hearing generation. So what about you? So really my experience is not monolithic. And of course, that's something that I want to show the rest of the community as well. That black, being black and deaf is a unique experience in itself. And so I am biologically black and white, and I fully cherish and identify my, uh, with my black, black identity, my black culture. And it's just 
fits with me, right? And so I also grew up in the hood. And that's what I'm used to. That's my culture. That's who I am. And since growing up, I've always had internal conflicts with my identity as a Black man, but also having a white mother. Now, again, I love my, my mother. <laughs> and again, she's a deaf woman. But And also recognizing my dad, who's a Black deaf man. And I love both my parents. I love who they are, and I want to be connected with both of them. And so with that, of course, I grew up in the hood, as I mentioned. And as I was you know, growing and learning about who I was as a Black person in school, um, well, primarily, I was more oftentimes identified as hard of hearing. Um, and also my, also, my first language is ASL because of my parents. And I was able to take advantage of both white culture and black culture as I was growing up and able to find myself in that. And was able to learn how to code switch as well. But also recognizing that code switching can be extremely exhausting to do to have to continually adjust to your space that you're in. So with my Black Death family, all of them pretty much signed, but a lot of them uh, were, grew up in oral uh, spaces. Do you mean like where there was no signing or sim comment? Really, it was a mixture of both. For example, the first Black generation of my, Black Death generation of my family, um, they were a Native American, uh, Black and Deaf. And they didn't sign, of course, because of accessibility in back in the day. Then the second generation, my great grandmother, she was deaf, but again, did not have access to sign language. Then at my grandparents was finally when ASL was in Included and they are also sent to a school for that. But this is at a time when schools were segregated, and so my grandparent went to the orphan, orphan and deaf, uh, deaf school. Um, and so that was a uh, BDO. That's what the school was called. So there was also an, an orphan hearing school, but all of the students uh, all were together in their own little system in their own world um, and so my grandmother was the first person in the family to actually have asl access so going back to the last five generations starting from my great grandmother sorry my great great grandparent and my gr grandmother um experienced hearing loss at a later age whereas in my grandparents uh lost their hearing earlier on. And so no one was really sick. It just happened at the age of five or, of five or six for some of my family members. And so we just noticed that a lot more people were just losing their hearing later on in life. So at the fourth generation, maybe remember correctly. <laughs> so fourth generation, which is my father, his cousin, um, we, me and my brother used to usually talk about this, but the deaf gene, we've noticed that there's at least three deaf people per gen generation of, in our family. So for this last generation, it's me, my brother, and my other brother as well. So the three of us are, are deaf. And so this has been really amazing to see how deaf, the deaf gene runs into my family and I look, love it extremely. But, um, my childhood, I was exposed to a lot of, you know, pros and cons and good and bad experiences in both my white side and black side of my family. And so again, I found myself code switching a lot, trying to understand and try to connect to those sides. Um, but I also had to grow up fast as well. Uh, I totally understand that. You know what what you're you know what you're exposed to more. 
you know, that's kind of what has a heavier influence on you. You know, what you're exposed to a heavier more, you know, is, is kind of what helps our evolution. You know, I'm the oldest in uh, my family and, you know, I had to be responsible for a lot. I had to see a lot, you know, so I'm from Oakland, California. And that's a tough city. You know, you gotta, you gotta keep your, you gotta be vigilant. You know, and, and, so, and our mental health sometimes, you know, and when we have to grow up fast, you know, when things are happening so much, uh, so happy, there's happening everywhere around us, we have to, you know, we have to proceed, process quickly. You know, as, as black deaf, you know, we give ourselves permission to relax, to chill. Just relax and chill. Yes, chill. Yes, yes, yes. That ex yes, chill. Exactly. You know, what is, you know, what is mental health for you? What? So I've experienced a lot of trauma growing up, um, just from the things I was exposed to. Um, my white family was pretty racist. And hmm. my dad's side of the family, they had to suffer the consequences of their racism. And so not just them, but the racism that they experienced from the world as well. So a lot of those experience I internalize in as well as just other traumatic events that just happened in my past um, that were pre my existence that kind of started back when my um, grandparents and great grandparents went the, the experiences that they had. Um, and it just became generational trauma that was just brought, passed down and just continued to you know affect the family members that came afterwards. And so my mental health, of course, with the trauma and depression, and having anxiety. Now, my anxiety is generational. It comes from my mother's side of the family. I also found out that some members of my father's side of the family also grew up with anxiety. But I noticed that it's different. For them. So with in terms of my white side of the family, they typically talk about it. And this is a common discussion, whereas in black households, that's not something that we talk about. That's not, that's not something we share with our community. And so there was two different experiences with having anxiety and have, having seen how both sides of my family dealt with it. Man, how'd you manage that? You know, I did, you know, and you know, being deaf. You know, do, uh, I, you know, how are you healing? You know, this quote unquote world. You know, with all with everything going on and being so busy, you know, that, 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 you know, is there deaf services uh, for the mental health? Like, so I'll, I'm fortunate to have grown up here in, in Dallas most of my life, and so I work for DAC, which is which is Deaf Action Center. So that is D D is deaf. Yep. Okay, A is in action. A action. C center. So DAC, but uh, call it DAC. Awesome. And so our ecosystem that we have is primarily run by deaf and hard of hearing individuals. We also have deaf clubs, really everything. We have everything here. In Dallas? And so before DAC came into existence, Black deaf people really communed at churches. And that's where we, that was our healing space. Um, and so, including my grandparents, so once DAC um, was set up here in, in Dallas. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Did you say there was a predominantly deaf black church? Yeah, a ministry, yes. Oh, okay. And, you know, it, it, went, it was really nice. Uh, and it's still up and running to this day. Um, I think it's been around for over 80 years, so we do have some history here. But again, that's something that we do not talk about in, in our community. We oftentimes, is focused on what's happening in the white depth spaces. So now, again, we should really be talking about our community. But again, our culture, black depth, black depth churches, black depth uh, spirituality, all those things, it's... Um, yes, yeah, so, so going back to uh, mental health. Um, I have general anxiety disorder. Uh, and so with GAD, it oftentimes make me, makes me overthink and overprocess. Um, I sometimes get anxious over time and I 
overthink and try, you know, try to plan out things too quickly. And so that's something I get from my mother's side. Now, recently what I found out from, from my father's side with uh, the anxiety that they experienced, again, being black, a black that family, but just really a black family in general, talking about these things was taboo. That was something that was out of the norm and not something that was not something that was common uh, for us to talk about in our household. Especially at being a collectivist culture as we as we are, that just was something that we didn't talk about. It's never something that was on the table. Um, but you know, but how can we really just support each other? Yes, and that's something we need to talk about now, as soon as possible. We need to give people, you know, uh, permission to talk about mental health now. You know, to give them time to allow themselves to get themselves to get t together, so we can serve each other. Man, you are. It, it's powerful that you're bringing this topic to light. Obviously, you are you are very active, very very active. You know, people in general, not just black deaf, but it, you know, healing. You know, we're working so hard to shift, and, and how, and how do you do that? Sometimes our worlds collide, right? They don't always overlap with each other. There's always, sometimes there's tension when that happens. And so I think with the benefit of DAC in, in the history of having white leaders, I think that oftentimes, again, is something we internalize, we get brainwashed and we get colonized from, right? And so once we're home and once we are able to remove that mask and remove all of that stuff that we are you know, being controlled with, I was finally able to allow myself to be myself. Um, and it's just been an exciting journey, um, especially with working with DAC because of it being a deaf owned uh, agency um, and also having about 80% deaf and hard of hearing staff as well. Um, we've built a culture where we are really supporting each other constantly. And <laughs> I also have the ability to leave work at work and come home and not have to think about any of that. But honestly, once I'm done with work, most of the time I go straight to, to mm. get out. Um, and being in the gym uh, gives me that release. How much you benching? Huh? How much you benching? Um, last time I checked, I think 180. 180. Hey, okay. Think, think 180. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, but the, the gym allows you, uh, exercise allows you to release. What else do you do? Uh, you know, just to disconnect. Sometimes I, I read. Um, I try, I'm trying to build a habit of reading more. Um, I do love books I, since I was a kid. No, it was awesome. Since I was a kid, I, I really never really enjoyed books as much. I used to always like put them aside, but reading now just creates a more peaceful um, experience for me. Also, I like to pray, um, pray to the divine, wh whatever being is out there, but just trying to connect with something out there, whether it be God or whatever it may be. Um, but also I love to, I love sports. I, I love cars. Um, I just love driving around and just going around Wind, winding down the road. Um, I also am a DoorDasher. <laughs> so um, basically I deliver food for people. So I pick up their food from restaurants and bring it to their to their homes. Um, so I, I don't know, I just love serving people in my community, especially now with, with COVID and everything. I, I mind you, I, I'm not a cook <laughs> at all. Um, so again, just as they go pick up their food, it's something that I do myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so you're just you're a facilitator of service. Yeah, definitely that would call myself that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I love driving. That gives me peace of mind. Um, reading, working out, running. Um, I just made that a new hobby of mine to run, um, which I, I really love. 
And I love eating too. <laughs> I really love eating. I'm definitely a foodie. Yeah, I'll say that. And no, so you said you mentioned you're working on uh, reading. Uh, you know, we're working on our mental health. Uh, but it's not something that it's easy to to get into, right? It, it, it's a discipline that requires practice. So you can say that, you know, you can start learning to love or, or enjoy something, uh, but it really takes that traditional practice and dedication to be devoted to something. Exactly. I agree with that. Again, I, I don't have an athletic form of my body. <laughs> so when it comes to like my, my brothers and my father, you know, they're more in sports folks than I am. And so I would say I'm more internally, I, I didn't become more of an athlete until my late twenties, but internally I'll say I was an athlete. I started picking up on things. Um, specifically, I got into CrossFit. And so I've been in that for almost seven, eight years now, I've been into CrossFit. Before I wasn't really much about, didn't care much about my health. I was a smoker, I ate terribly. Um, a lot of it, you know, dealt it was because of trauma or either traumatized me as well. And so it just came to a point where I looked in the mirror and I didn't like what I saw. And at one point I was 120 pounds and I was a 38 waist and I just, it just wasn't a healthy time for me. And so one day as I was driving, I had seen a CrossFit sign on a building. So I thought, why not? Let me go ahead and enroll. Uh, so I went in, you know, I started and really the community there um, didn't know ASL at all, but they're really patient with me and all the questions that I had. And I was just really fortunate in that experience. You woke up. Uh, you got deaf woke. You know what I mean? You know, you were like, you know what, enough of, enough of this. You know, and you invested into something and look at where you are now. So I see that you have you have different names on your shirt. Uh, what's the shirt about? What are the people about? So I had wore this for a, um, a pride parade in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, that's my second home, Little Rock. And so I had bought this shirt there and I thought, well, this name here, Harvey Milk. And that was their hometown as well. Um, or I remember you're in San Francisco, right? <laughs> so right there, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm in Oakland. So yeah, he was in San Francisco. Then there's Marsha P. Johnson. Um, she had thrown the brick that started the Stonewall riots. Uh, and the person that really, um, along with Sylvia Rivera. They were the ones who were the trailblazers when it came to uh, LGBT rights and activism. Go ahead, and, is, is, what did you say? They're the one that pushed for us, for me, for you, for the LGBT community. Um, I see James. I see James James Baldwin. Yes, my favorite person as well, James Baldwin. I love James Baldwin. I'm starting to get more into his books as I'm reading and like other stories and articles about him. Um, but really just, they're just an authentic black queer man. And that's really hard to find, especially because of when reading books about LGBTQ community, oftentimes there's a white savior, a white leader, a white author, and we're not oftentimes in those stories. And so when I was exposed to James Baldwin, um, there was as many people who just knew who he was and except for me. And so once my brother had told me about his book and I started reading it, I finally felt a connection. I felt like I belonged to some community. And
the journey of, of becoming more radical has started from there. Which is a perfect segue to my next question. And who's your role model? Do you have role models? I have quite a few role models. I would first say my first role model, role model is my brother, Brandon. Um, I look up to him so much. He's my first friend. I call him my first friend at least, just because we were we were always understanding of each other. Even though we went on different paths, we always end up coming right back to each other and creating that connection instantly. And so I would say that he was one of my first role models because he always pushed me and encouraged me to do good, to be myself, to be vulnerable, and also to be just open. And so my brother has also been a huge part of my mental health journey. Another role model would be my family, my Black Death family. I just have so many Black Death family members who have passed away, including my father. And all of them, I just, I just learned so much from them, their experiences, their struggles, their successes. And, and also the history, I, I learned a lot from them. So a lot of them are my role models. So I would say that. Wow. Man, I'm loving your brother too now. <laughs> so I know you, you know, we're naming the people on your shirt, which brings us to our next segment of the show called Name These People. Yeah. All right. So the name of this game is Name These People. So you have two different ways to get it right. Audience, now you can also participate by typing in the chat box if you think you know who it is. So the, there's two different ways of, of trying to figure out who these people are. Uh, you can either... Uh, so now what I'll do is I'll give I'll have a picture with a visual description, which I'll provide the description. And then you can either maybe name, you know, what they do or, you know, maybe you know who they are by name. All right, we ready? Ready. All right, let's go. Here we go. Let me do a little stretch here. A visual description, a picture of a Creole American female appears in her one side brown and black coloring braids, wears a pair of small silver hoop earrings, a light blue scarf, and a black long sleeve blouse. She looks at the camera smiling happily. Who is she? Um, I don't know. She seems as to be professional professor maybe a black deaf professor um but that's all i can mention about her yeah this is dr leanne you are right she's an incredible uh teacher though she was on last week's episode She's a native of California uh, at the Career Technical Education. She's a principal there. Uh, it's a California school for the deaf. Her dissertation centered on Black deaf lives, a matter in deaf education. She's incredible. Visual description, a picture of an African-American male appears in his thin gray hair to be almost hairless, a thin trimmed gray goatee, wears a pair of, sil pair of silver framed eyeglasses, that matches uh, to a black suit jacket with a blue collar and a light blue and navy spotted tie. Looking away at the camera and grinning. Who is he? I, I'm pretty biased on this one. <laughs> Obviously, this is Dr. Anderson Glenn. Or Glenn Anderson. Yep. 100%. Dr. Glenn Anderson. Yep. And he's a, a native of uh, Little Rock, Arkansas uh, in your hometown. Uh, he's the first deaf black male who received a PhD from Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. He's a community activist in the deaf black uh, community. Um, he's my, he was my first interviewee on Deaf Woke. 
visual description of picture of an African American female appears in her black curly hair uh, on one side on the left, wears a pair of black cat framed eyeglasses, a multi colors and pink short sleeve blouse, has a deep red color on her uh, lips, sits in a black uh, mobile wheelchair, looking at the camera, smiling happily. Who is she? I'm not sure who this is, but she's a very beautiful person. Her name is Andrea Lavant. She's a native of Tampa, Arizona, uh, is the president of the, and chief exclusion uh, office of Lavant Counseling Incorporation. Through Lavant Counseling, Andrea teaches uh, brands ways to create disability uh, inclusive marketing campaigns. She was the impact producer uh, for the Oscar nominated 2020 documentary, Crip Cramp, A Disability Revolution. She's also a host of Crip Cramp on Facebook. I definitely have to take a look at that soon. Visual description of a picture of an African American male appears in his black, uh, thin, low haircut, black, thin, stubble goatee, wears a, in a gray suit with a white collar and a matching gray tie, folds his arms, looking at the camera and smiling happily. Who is he? Um, I don't know his name, but I know his face. Mm, yep. This is uh, Mark Lamont Hill. Yeah, I've met him before. Now he's from Philly. He's an American uh, academic author activist. Cool. It's a visual description, a picture of a Chinese American female appears in her long brown hair and a pair of red black framed eyeglasses. Wears in a blue blouse, leans against uh, a beige wall, turning to look at the camera and smiling happily. This is an important person. Who is she? I don't know who this is. <laughs> My apologies. I'm learning, learning about new people. Yes, that's the point, man. Learning something new. This is Miss Patty Lang. She's from Seattle, Washington. Uh, you know, I think this is somebody that we can introduce you to. Please. Uh, she's an executive director of Deaf Spotlight. Patty has pursued opportunities that uh, encourage the deaf community to embrace and celebrate arts. She's a BFA in ceramic from the University of Washington and in the master's in nonprofit management for the arts from New, New York University. Let's go. She also appeared on the 13th episode of Deaf Woke. Visual description, a picture of African-American male, appears in his black short locks with slightly goatee, wears in his short-sleeved washed blue shirt that has a bluff slash gold printing of Gallaudet's mascot, Bison 1964, looks at the camera grinning. Who is he? What do you think he does? Think of his name right now. I know you know who it is. I know he's performed somewhere, but I can't remember his name right now. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know you. I knew you know who it was. Yes, you did. He's cool. Now, he's fourth generation deaf. He's from a fourth generation deaf. Uh, his name is Franklin Jones Jr. Franklin Jones Jr. is a native of uh, Wad Mulshaw Island in South Carolina. He's a fourth generation deaf in his family. He's a faculty uh, lecturer at the Boston University. Now she's cool. Now she's from my town here in Oakland. This is a picture of an African American female appears in her long black braids on the right side, has long black eyelashes and a hot pink color on her lips, an inscribed tattoo on her chest, along with two silver necklaces, wears a blue, blue V top. Looks at the camera, grinning with dimples shown. Who is she? Uh, first, I want <laughs> the tattoo. It's just inspiring just to see that. Um, but um, you know, uh, I know that. Acting, 
I th I think you have a correlation. There's a correlation between you. Are they an interpreter or deaf interpreter? Her name is Alicia Garza. Uh, that's probably why you may not know her. She's you know she's hearing, um, but she's a co-founder of the International Black Lives Matter movement along with Opel oh, Tamiti. I knew I knew her face. She created an inspiring and slogan uh, when after the July 2013 acquittal of George Zimmerman of the murder of the deaf of Trayvon Martin. Uh, so she's on that same on that same wavelength. It's it's time. It's black people time. It's good. It's a, a visual description. A picture of an African-American uh, male appears in his uh, black long cornrows hair trimmed black. Thin mustache, stubble, thick beard, wearing a white top with a black black leather patch on the right on his right neck, looks at the camera, grinning shyly. Who is he? That is Mr. Colin Kaepernick. Definitely much love for him. Yeah. I think the audience got it too. Colin is a native of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He's an American civil rights activist and a former football quarterback. He played for the, uh, six seasons for the San Francisco 49ers uh, in the National Football League. He also has a show on Netflix called Colin in Black and White, uh, which seen, is based on a true story of his teenage years. I've seen it. It's truly amazing. I, I just I felt so connected in watching it. You've watched it? Yeah, I, I would definitely suggest you watch it as well. It's really good. All right, I'll take that suggestion. A uh, visual picture of an African-American female appears in her long black cornrow braids, wears a short, thin silver necklace and a warm red blouser, a jacket with a little black top from the inside, folds her arms with a gold watch, looking at the camera and smiling happily. Who is she? No clue. <laughs> Sorry. But also a beautiful person. I don't know who it is, man. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, she's deaf. Okay. This is Ashura Michelle. She's a, a native of Kenya in Africa. Okay. Uh, is a member of the Orange Democratic Movement, uh, official op the official opposition party in Kenya. She's a human rights and gender activist. In the past, Ashura was the first deaf person elected to be the speaker of the East African Youth Parliament. Woo! This is who we are talking. This is what we're talking about. All right, there's two more, I, I think. This is a visual description picture of African-American male. Appears in his top hairless head with white short hair sides. White trimmed mustache. Wears a gray horizontal striped dark green shirt with two buttons. Opening the collar, he poses uh, in the front of a camera, pointing to his right ear as he's signing, signing deaf. From looking at the picture, it just gives me a Southern vibe. S something historical about this picture here. I don't know who this is, but there's something about it that just seems like a nice one. Yeah, that's right. This is Charles Chuck Williams. I've learned something new today. He's a native of Cleveland, Ohio. He's one of the founders uh, of the 1982 th founded 30 years of National Black Deaf Advocates. Uh, the founders are in the following to list as the Low T. Croak, Ernest Harrington, Willard Short, Linwood Smith, and Elizabeth Wilson. Chuck is iconic 90 year old leader and activist for the Black Deaf community. Uh, in recent, his name is the formation of the Charles V. Williams Scholarship Fund for Ohio Native of deaf students who received the, uh, the acceptance from the Gallaudet University. Boom! What? 
Man, I'm learning something new with you. <laughs> me too. Me too. You know who she is? Uh, I don't know. Well, this is a, a visual picture of an African American female it appears in her honey brown afro curly hair with a, a red ha headband, wears a pair of small silver hoop earrings, a black blouse with a red beaded mid long necklace, and a gold watch on her right hand wrist. Folds her arms facing to the camera and smiles happily. Who is she? Come on, audience. I need your help with this one. This is June, also broke. Uh, native of Alabama is a motivational speaker focusing on Black deaf history and Black sign language. She's currently working on a project of BASL uh, and segregation along with two others. Oh, I love it. Oh, the picture does a did a little bit different, uh, but I know who she is. She's been on this show before. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Let's get it. Woo! Hey. Uh, so the name these people, um, I have uh, somebody who uh, helps me put together the slides. Uh, so sometimes I'm learning something new, you know, uh, you know, we're learning something new every day about our deaf black history or just black history in general. Uh, and this is this is that time. You know, going to college. You know, I've read a book about Malcolm X. Um, and I was the only, was, ironically, I was the only black individual in that class. And so you're reading, trying to get this education in class. No, it's about hands-on. It's about our time. It's about learning who we are, learning about our people. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. Definitely agree. I know our time is almost up, but Thank I want to give our, uh, the opportunity to our audience members. This is the time, audience. So, you know, you've been sitting patiently watching, uh, tuning in to Jermaine Williams. Now, this is your time to ask uh, Jermaine any questions. So I got a direct message. So since that you're, how did you research that, you know, that you're sixth generation? You know, is your family all spread out or, you know, how, what do you mean regarding research? So I can't really talk too much about the research right now, but I do have to admit, I am quite proud of, I, one, I just found out that one of the indigenous uh, nations um, is, I, I, I am indigenous to one of the nations and my grandfather himself is, was a native member. Papa, so, Papa John um, was what his name. So again, he didn't have access to ASL. Um, also someone had told me that he was also a really mean person. Um, <laughs> um, but me, uh, strict, <laughs> but you know, uh, just really protective. But yeah, but again, I'm just still doing research right now. So here's a question: I feel like uh, more blacks with mental health. You know, there were more mental health because of COVID nineteen, or is that just in general? Yes, and the reason why I feel like that COVID-19 was a call Pandora's box. It's because once this happened, it just seemed like everything was unleashed. COVID-19 made everyone, you know, more isolated and have to, made us more introspective and have to really unpack a lot of things. And so within the deaf community, I had to learn and unpack a lot of things that I was taught. And also immediately, the Black deaf community support had 
I, I had just continued. And so COVID-19 definitely allowed me to really remove the veil, um, even though we had to wear masks. But when it came to the world, oftentimes we were hiding ourselves in our own homes. Um, but really it was just something that that needed to, needed to change. And so with COVID, I'm not saying that we needed that to happen, but it did need to happen. It forced us to all wake up and it made us all But yes, made, us all look, made, us, made us all just look inward. So I do agree that in general that we do need to open up a lot more. And I'm still writing my story in this process, but COVID-19 changed a lot of things. Any advice for us to support Black men who struggle opening up with their mental health? You know, you had mentioned, you know, uh, you know, uh, op having people open up, but how how do we do that? I recently learned a difference between there's a difference between the LGBTQ Black community and also the queer cisgender cisgender Black. Queer. Oftentimes, within the LGBT career, Black community, we oftentimes are pretty much connected, but whereas cisgendered men tend to, to be more resistant. And so my advice would be just to listen. And it's just something as simple as that, just, just saying, I'm hurting inside. If someone says I'm hurting inside, say, okay, I'm here to support, I'm here to listen. and and intentionally listen not listen to re to react but listen to comprehend and so as these people are unpacking themselves don't try to add your two cents in or whatnot just just listen and i would say that that's my advice question have you had any unfavorable experiences uh, as a door dasher yes i have um, this actually recently happened on my birthday, actually. So I turned 36 on August 28th. Um, I'm 36 years old. <laughs> yes, I am 36. Um, so up until my birthday, I had really loved being a DoorDasher. I, you know, I thought it was going to be something pretty easy. It's not going to be a lot of challenges. But the evening of my birthday, I went to pick up an order and I was on my way to deliver it. As I had gotten out of my car, I had followed the instructions that were put in the app. I went ahead and rang the doorbell of the, the, the housing unit. And the person who had ordered the food apparently was in an Airbnb. So where I had rang the doorbell, was not the location of where his airbnb was and so i thought oh okay well i should just go ahead and enter the backyard because he said that he's in the back of the property so i went ahead and walked over to the back and again me being deaf right so someone had came over to me and was talking and as i turned over this white person who was seemed to be the owner of the house was talking and I had tried to communicate that I was delivering this food for this person in the house. I told him the name. And he was like, no one lives here. And he was actually really respectful. He was really nice and everything. Um, but then I also remember I grew up in the hood uh, and I'm very familiar with people bringing out rifles and guns and what, whatnot on me. So a traumatic experience. And so what happened was his wife had came out the door with the shotgun in her hand ready and i was like no i i'm i'm innocent i'm not doing anything i'm just delivering food and the husband had to though 
be escalated situation with his wife and say, no, go back, go back inside. And I became extremely nervous and shaking. And I walked back to my car and the person who had ordered the food had finally come out into the car and repeatedly was trying to apologize. But I was just ready to go and hand off the food. And I was like, just take the food so I can go. But since then, it's, it's been uh, about four months. I still process that experience every single time. And I really have to just remind myself that there are a lot of people who are out there in the community who are experiencing mental health issues. Um, of course, some of it might be from racism, but just might be just fearful of their lives and whatever. And, and I will never really know, but I was just, just thankful to, to be here today. Um, so that was the, the, the most unfavorable experience I've had as a DoorDasher. Next question is, I have uh, deaf white friends uh, who have biracial deaf children. What advice can you give uh, to a deaf child who faces difficulty to find their own identity? I remember you had mentioned, you know, code switching is exhausting. Yes, code switching is exhausting, but it's also a lot of benefits in, in it. I would say just pay attention to everything. Question everything. Continue to be inquisitive of your white side of your family and your black side of your family. Continue asking questions. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help from either side of your family either. For me, when I was younger, I wish I had asked more questions, which would help me, you know, guide me in the direction I wanted. But having grown up in the hood, I had to grow up really quickly and learn things as I went. And so I learned to survive. And so my experience with all that being in the hood had an influence of me on my childhood. Um, but I, again, I, I tried to ask as much as I can, try to divulge as much of myself as possible, but also being willing to open up and recognize what's going on, um, but never give up. I feel that kids have, kids today have more access than I did back then. Um, I hit you know a lot of walls in, in my journey and it's because of religion, because of politics, a lot of things, you know, had an impact on me. And I think I came out around the age of 17, 18. And right now I'm really starting to find out who I am. And I'm recognizing there's a lot that I have to let go and, and unpack. And so I would say just as a kid, recognize that you'll be involved in going to the wall. And so I'll say that. Beautiful, beautifully stated. That was a wonderful response. You know, if you can go back in time, you know, I, you probably what you would say, you know, accept who you are, love who you are. Absolutely. I try to remind myself about that every single day, just to show myself that I am my own friend. So I have to be kind or, or grace, gracious to myself. Become my own best friend. That is something that I say all the time. Become my own best friend, take care of myself, hug myself, cry if I need to. And that's really important. Statement is, is as you said, you wish oh, a while ago, uh, will you consider to be a mentor for deaf teen uh, teenagers who are biracial? I know it's a big ask, yet have you considered it lately? Actually, yes, I have, because um, again, the more guidance, the more role models, the more mentors there are, really just as a, as a biracial kid, there's just so much that I had dealt with, and I just wish that there was someone that I could look up to, um, and even just a, a deaf role model would have been And I, I wouldn't mind just being a different model to anyone. 
I mean, we don't have enough time in the day to chat with uh, J Jermaine. However, you can follow Jermaine on Instagram, social media, IG specifically at Jermaine.period. That is J E R M A I N E dot P E R I O D. Man, go ahead, please follow, follow him, learn more. You know, maybe you may have a few questions a little later. Jermaine, thank you. Do you have any last words, comments you would like to share with the audience? Um, let me think. Keep an open mind. Be willing to learn. And keep feeling inspired. And also keep those who are around you that supporting your journey close. And be your own best friend. Mic drop. <laughs> Mic drop. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your story, being vulnerable with us. I've learned so many amazing things from you. Uh, and there's so much more for you to do. I'll be seeing you again very soon. And so I wish you a good new year. Thank you too. Take care. Wow, man, J Jermaine's been, you know, making me cry. Give me, he said, make me shed some tears. He's an incredible person, yeah? So my final thought, you know, all good and all deaf families. No, there's so much more story, so much more to learn. There's different challenges that different families experience. We need to have the space to allow people to listen to one another, understand each other. We think that we assume that based on what we see. No, no, ask. Be willing to listen. Listen in different ways. No, not just listening, but listening with intent. Because if you can do that, you'll evolve they'll evolve and growing is a beautiful thing in our community we need to grow together you know and we all grow at different rates you know, like trees some trees grow faster than others we need to find a way to shift our focus on each other so then we in a later time can become our own best friends. That's a powerful slogan, being your own best friend. And, we need, and when you get from your community, you can give it back to your community. And when it's your time, you can share that wisdom. You know, we need time to introspect, to understand, to show who we are. We all have different struggles on different paths. But it's, it's it's salient that you be you. I'm Antoine Hunter, Purple Fire Crow. I want to say thank you to everyone, everyone who's watched today's episode. But I have a few thanks I have to give. Of course, Jermaine Williams the interpreters and I've, come on audience thank y'all for watching man we've had a lot of people tune, tuning in thank you to how round drop labs gfta and of course you come on now let me see these likes these hearts come on where they at come on come on let me see these on my page so my shirt was made by pop fish 
They also made me a mask. Ooh, mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, thank you to Popfish. So please share this episode with other people. Maybe this episode can save another person's life. And if you can, uh, please donate to keep Deaf Woke going. And again, thank you. Thank you all for watching Deaf Woke. I don't really have a last word other than peace, love, I'm out. Where's my music at? Where, 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 where's it at? Where's it at? Thank <laughs> you.